Yeah, okay. Um, I think we can actually get started. The rest may, if, if they want to, they can actually watch the, um, the start of the lecture on YouTube. <laughs> so um, today's topic will be Ubicomp. So ubiquitous computing and Internet of Things. The, these are mostly two buzzwords and there's actually a dedicated lecture for Ubicomp. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I'll try to cover some, some a little more technical aspects that maybe aren't part of the other lecture. Um, first of all, maybe for some organizational things again, I think the interesting part this time is actually the, the lower half about how we will, will manage the projects. So um, next Friday we will have another tutorial, which is just a, a session where you can bring your laptop and have and ask specific questions and Johannes and I will try to to help you out with specific things. Um, then on June 24th, so roughly three and a half weeks from today, we will have another round of these very short meetings with each team. Um, on June 29th, we won't have a lecture anymore, but we will just look at old exam questions and so you get a, get a feeling of how the exam will actually look like. Uh, on July 6th and 8th, we will have the final presentation, so that's uh, Wednesday and that's Friday. So we'll just split it up so we don't have to squeeze everything uh, into, into one, uh, one and a half hours. And then on July 27th, there will be the exam in between. So in theory, there would be one extra lecture on July 13th, but that's immediately before summary. So uh, I think we'll just, uh, we'll just skip that one because we already covered all the material we, we wanted to and I don't think it's really necessary to squeeze everything into the last week. So we'll do that uh, in the two weeks before instead. Okay, so now about ubiquitous computing. The original term is actually pretty old. It's from 1991 from Mark Weiser uh, and the, the uh, basic idea is that the computing power you have basically disappears into, into your everyday environment. You don't have a, basically don't have a dedicated computer anymore, but there's, there's computing power built into so many things that you can just use it whenever you like. And the, the central idea was that you have three classes of devices, um, tabs, pads, and boards. Uh, a board would be something like an, like an interactive whiteboard. A uh, pad would be roughly something like an iPad and a tab would be a little smaller, something in between uh, like a very small smartphone. Uh, and if you look at what you can buy in every store now today, uh, this, this vision basically has arrived. So you can buy all of these things in the store. So uh, basically ubiquitous computing has arrived. Um, but that's not entirely true because this original vision actually contained also some, some other aspects. It also uh, contained aspects about how easy it is to interact with these um, devices. It's what also sometimes uh, later it has been called calm computing or ambient computing or pervasive computing and the, the uh, other part of that vision isn't just having devices everywhere and uh, computing power integrated everywhere, but also uh, uh, helping the user set up these things without really needing to do much, much of uh, much of a setup at all. So it should, in theory, just work. But uh, now, if you think about uh, maybe if you, you've tried to use two Bluetooth devices at the same time with your phone at some point. That's actually uh, not working very well in many scenarios. Did it work for you with uh, headphones? But it, but it really works shady with my PC. Okay, yeah, there you go. So, in, it, so it works, it maybe works with one device, but then you try to switch to another one and it stops working or you try to, to use um, headphones and the mouse, Bluetooth mouse at the same time and suddenly everything stops working. So um, we already have the devices from that original vision but what we don't have is the, the effortless way to connect the devices with each other which was kind of the, also part of the original vision. Um, 
So, and the next, next thing we'd, we'd like to discuss today is the Internet of Things. This is actually, right now, this is mostly just a marketing term. So, um, the central idea is kind of overlapping with ubiquitous computing, and the idea is simply we put connectivity everywhere. So, we, in, into every chair, into every uh, desk, into every piece of, of into every pen I can use to write somewhere, we put, just put sensors and internet connectivity everywhere. That's the uh, basic idea when, when people talk about internet of things. Of course, that's not feasible right now, but um, so the, the focus is also currently not so much onto devices you use yourself, but on devices in the environment. For example, there's um, lots of concepts or, or prototypes, uh, for example, of smart fridges um, or uh, smart water meters, so utility devices you have in your home um, should, should somehow be connected to the internet and therefore become smart. Um, and the basic idea is that if, for example, your fridge knows all the time how much milk you have left, then it can basically automatically uh, put a, a notification on your shopping list that you're, you're running out of milk, or maybe it will even automatically order milk off Amazon or something like that. Um, that's at least the basic idea behind this. Um, and, of course, all we currently have are lots of not so well working prototypes for that idea. Um, where this may, may have a little more potential even if, if, if you put it into, uh, for example, manufacturing processes. So if uh, every machine in some factory has, internet, has an internet connection and can maybe report that it's, uh, it's starting to, to vibrate if, uh, in an unexpected way, and then people can fix the machine before it completely breaks down. So this is maybe an application which makes a little more sense. Um, the idea of the smart fridge sounds maybe nice on paper, but uh, we'll, we'll look into some reasons why this doesn't really work properly right now. Um, oh, come on. doesn't work again. So I've already mentioned uh, part of these, so the, the uh, official goals which people talk about when they want to sell you some kind of Internet of Things application are that they want to help you automate a really trivial tasks like shopping for milk, or they want to um, help you increase your efficiency, for example, because uh, your washing machine turns on automatically only when the electricity is really cheap also an example which, which has been used quite often. Or, uh, for example, in factories you can have uh, a smarter uh, uh, production chain, so you can uh, have to order less, less stuff in advance and can order it right, right at the, the point when you need it because, your, uh, for example, your machine can tell you, okay, I'm, I'm starting to run out of of screws, there's only 20% left, you should order some more. So that's, that's all uh, the, the publicly stated goals which people try to make arguments for this Internet of Things for. But of course there's also some, some other goals which aren't maybe that obvious. So of course for some companies the goal is to just sell more wireless sensor modules because if you put one everywhere, then you will, of course, be able to sell billions and billions of little devices that somehow have connectivity. Um, and it's also, uh, of course, for companies like Google and Facebook, this is also interesting because they would then be able to gather even more data about consumers. So, for example, they uh, then they might know things that like uh, that you drink two, uh, two boxes of milk per week or something like that, and then you actually get, get uh, advertisements for, uh, I don't know, other kinds of milk. So, <laughs> but in, in general, um, we already talked about this, Google and Facebook generally have the, um, the business model of collecting as much data about you 
as, as possible. And so, of course, this is also interesting for them. Um, so, uh, and this can actually happen in very unexpected ways. So let's assume you have a wireless power meter. This is actually, in theory, a good thing because then uh, you don't need some, some guy going to your basement and actually writing down the numbers on your uh, power meter uh, every half a year. So the power meter can just tell the energy company how many kilowatt hours you, you used in the last month. And you can even see it uh, for yourself on, on your computer and can maybe, uh, maybe save a little energy at the same time. But if you actually have uh, real-time real -time power consumption data, then, for example, you can tell what movies people are watching. Does anybody have an idea how you can do this? By just looking at how much power a, a certain flat uh, consumes. Uh, how is that even possible? Do you have an idea? No, even you can tell, okay, these guys are just watching Terminator 3. You can actually do that, yeah? Yeah, that's uh, going in the right direction. So what you can actually do is you can basically create a brightness profile of a movie because dark scenes will, of course, be darker and will use less energy for the TV and bright scenes will be brighter and lose, use more energy. And when you have a, a profile of the whole movie, then you can detect that pattern again in the energy consumption data. And then can, you can actually tell exactly what movie um, people are watching just by looking at what uh, the energy consumption is. And so for that reason, um, so in completely unexpected ways, this can give people more data about you. Yeah. Well, of course, it's not exactly uh, legal, but um, that's also an issue we're going to talk about later in a bit more detail. Um, so the power company maybe doesn't even want to do this. They just want to collect uh, power data. But what often happens is that people don't really care about the security of these Internet of Things uh, applications because, for example, the power company will tell you, uh, what's the matter? It's just, it's just a few numbers of power consumption data. And so this data is, for example, often unencrypted and everybody can just look at the data if they're close enough to the building and look at the right radio frequency, for example. Then they, you can actually collect all the, the power consumption data. And then you can, for example, tell what movie are people watching or more importantly, you could tell if people are actually at home or not. So you can uh, then uh, uh, break in and clear out the flat if nobody's home. So for all these reasons, this is of course not legal, but it's, it's um, often possible because the, the people who built the original uh, application don't really care about security because they don't think uh, far enough that this kind of thing might actually be possible. So that's the, the uh, one part of the problem here, I guess. Okay, so um, I don't know if you've he ever heard of the Gartner hype cycle. This is something very interesting, I think. This is, uh, Gartner is a big market research company and uh, every year they put out this hype cycle where they um, rate different, uh, different technologies as to how, how hyped they are, basically. And there's, um, there's basically uh, four or five phases. So this is when stuff uh, starts basically to become interesting. Some people have maybe done some research projects and uh, maybe there's a couple of startups where people start to put in money. And then uh, comes this, this peak of inflated expectations where everybody basically starts to pour in insane amounts of money and everybody will tell you that this will solve all the problems of the planet, basically. Um, and I think this curve is from 2014, but it hasn't really changed in the last year. So Internet of Things is actually at the 
exact peak here of this hype cycle because everybody, it, it, it really shifted just a little bit uh, from uh, in, in 2015, so it's still very much at the peak, so everybody expects this to basically solve all the problems we have and will tell you as much, but of course that's, that's completely overblown. And then of course afterwards comes this, this uh, slump where everybody realizes that this won't solve all problems after all, and so at that point everybody will tell you it's, it was a waste of time, it's complete crap, we don't need that. And only afterwards, after uh, this, this slump has passed, then people will actually um, try, uh, then the, the expectations and the reality will at some point start to align for uh, some technologies. And I've already mentioned Internet of Things is really at the very top right now. It still is the same for variable user interfaces. Um, what's also kind of related to Internet of Things is machine to machine communication. This is already, uh, has already <laughs> gone down quite a lot. And NFC is really at the, at the bottom actually right now. So uh, a few years ago, everybody was telling you that NFCs will be everywhere and NFC will solve all our problems. And uh, yeah, so completely overblown expectations. And right now, er nobody is talking about NFCs anymore because people realized that the expectations were completely overblown. Of course, that doesn't mean that NFC is completely useless, but uh, it will just have to, to adjust to reality now at some point. Um, and yeah, so Internet of Things and Ubicom are really, or especially Internet of Things is really at the very top right now um, and still is. Uh, so this is kind of what, so everything people tell you about this, this uh, whole IoT complex has to be taken with a lot of salt to, uh, to adjust for these really overblown expectations right now. Um, so what are the big issues we, we have to deal with? So to, to conclude this, this introduction about that topic basically, of course we have to deal with uh, power supply. So if you assume that at some point really every chair here in the room has some kind of sensor so that the university doesn't have to uh, paste those little labels on everything anymore, but and you can just look up online where all the chairs are. Um, that would actually save a lot of work, so it's not a, quite as crazy as, as it sounds in the first place, because there really are people going around the university every half a year and try to re-find all the chairs that have been moved between different rooms, because every chair in theory is supposed to be in one specific, specific room and so on. If you could automate this, that this would of course be great. But then you would need some guy who changes all the batteries every half, a, uh, maybe every year. So that wouldn't really, uh, really change anything. So for this to properly work, you would need some kind of yeah, energy harvesting, as it's usually called. So you don't actually have a battery anymore in your device, but you somehow gather energy from the environment, uh, just uh, uh, sunlight, for example, like in a, in a pocket calculator, an old one. Um, or temperature differences, all of these can actually be used to power these devices, but of course it's a lot, getting a lot more difficult then. Um, other things are interaction concepts, I already mentioned this, so the original Ubicom idea uh, contains uh, a lot of, of thought about how you don't have to put in pin numbers anymore to, to interact with devices. And I think this is a really important aspect. So um, if, if you try to send a, a photo via Bluetooth between two mobile phones, then you sometimes have to spend five minutes up front before it works and it could be a lot simpler uh, or it should be a lot simpler. But right now it's not. So this is also something where this is really lacking. And of course, Privacy and security, or I already mentioned this uh, right now because maybe even because this is right at the top of this hype cycle, everybody is so excited that they don't really care about the, the security issues at all. And people often say, yeah, we can fix that later, but um, if, if history is any indication, then it will never get fixed. So this is also something which we should think about right now. 
And the final issue, in my opinion, is that there aren't really any standards at the moment. So everybody's building their own implementation. I'll talk about this in a bit more detail afterwards, too. Um, everybody uh, has some kind of uh, homegrown protocol. So, of course, you can buy smart light bulbs from different companies, but then you also, if you have smart light bulbs from, I don't know, three companies, then you're actually, you, uh, as it is right now, you also need to have three different apps on your phone to actually control them, which uh, kind of uh, defeats the original point again. Okay, so this is kind of a First overview over UbiComp and IoT. Um, do you have any any more questions about that at the moment? 